persons. Culture site, orbicide, and ecocide committed by Armenia during the occupation are patterns of the Armenian state-sponsored and flourishing policy of Azerbaijanophobia, estin hatred, and racist ideology. It was not accidentally that in relation to Azerbaijan's request for the provisional measures, measures ICJ in his recent ruling ordered Armenia to take all necessary measures to prevent incitement and promotion of racial hatred targeted at persons of Azerbaijani national or ethnic origin. Contrary to the Armenian minister's remarks, the court rejected Armenia's request for the right of access to and enjoyment of its alleged cultural heritage in the liberated territories of Azerbaijan, as well as the request to oblige Azerbaijan to facilitate and refrain from placing any impediment on efforts to protect and preserve historic culture and religious heritage. Mr. President, Azerbaijan is confident that there is no alternative for, to the normalization of relations between two countries based on mutual recognition and respect for each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity within the international recognized borders, and will continue its consistent efforts to ensure the lasting peace and stability in the region. This Council should also play its positive role in this process and urge Armenia to fulfill its obligations on the trilateral statements of 10 November 2020, as well as 11th January and 26th November of last year. I thank you. Gracias. Tiene la palabra la delegación de Turquía. Mr. President, we are using our rights of reply regarding the unfounded accusations made against Turkey during the high-level segment. We categorically reject these baseless allegations. We would like to remind that in Syria, it is the regime itself which, constitutes, which continues to use starvation and interruption of essential services such as electricity and water as a weapon to punish civilians in Elbab, Resuline, Tel Aviv, and recently in Dera. We are currently hosting more than 3.5 million, million Syrians and providing support to about 5 million more inside Syria on health, education and many other basic services. Without this vital support, these Syrians would be forced to further displacement within their country or subject to immigration to other countries. We will continue to defend the territorial integrity and political unity of Syria against any separatist agenda. We believe that Syrian conflict can only be resolved through a political process on the basis of UN Security Council Resolution 2254. Instead of blaming other countries, the regime should participate in and contribute to the political process in a meaningful and result-oriented way, in line with the aspirations of the Syrian people. Mr. President, on the Cyprus issue, the only occupation in Cyprus is the occupation of the seat of government of the once partnership Republic of Cyprus by the Greek Cypriots for more than 50 years. The inherent equal rights and political equality of Turkish Cypriots, acknowledged by international Cyprus treaties, give them not only co-ownership but equal rights and equal say on the whole island and its destiny. We call on the international community to recognize Turkish Cypriots' inherent rights of equal status and sovereignty. For more than 50 years, it is the Turkish Cypriot people who have been suffering from the non-settlement of the Cyprus issue. The Turkish Cypriot people have been prevented from exercising their basic human rights deriving from principles enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights without any meaningful and tenable explanation or justification. It is regrettable that the Turkish Cypriot people are still being denied their rightful representation and participation in the international fora and bodies, effectively preventing Turkish Cypriot people from being heard. As a consequence, in the absence of the Turkish Cypriot people, the Greek Cypriot side is allowed to exploit its participation in international platforms to blatantly distort historical and legal facts about Cyprus. It is high time that this August Assembly addresses this issue. Mr. President, on a final note, Turkey implements the judgments of Cyprus-related cases before the European Court of Human Rights. In fact, three clusters of Cyprus versus, was, versus Turkey was closed. Thank you. Gracias. Tiene la palabra la delegación de Cuba. Rechazo el comentario del canciller de la República Checa sobre Cuba, que constituye una injerencia inadmisible en los asuntos internos de mi país. 
resulta inaceptable la tergiversación de los hechos y la pretensión de cuestionar cómo Cuba aplica su legislación vigente en nuestro territorio nacional, incluido el tratamiento a los delincuentes y mercenarios que trabajan por dinero extranjero contra el orden público, la constitución y la ley. Nos preocupan las graves violaciones de los derechos humanos en República Checa. Las continuas políticas de discriminación e intolerancia contra las minorías son inaceptables. Rechazamos la violación de los derechos y libertades de los niños y niñas romaníes que son víctimas de segregación y discriminación institucionalizada en territorio checo. Señor Presidente, el Secretario de Estado de los Estados Unidos mencionó en su discurso a un grupo de países en el que incluyó a Cuba, sobre los que dice tener preocupaciones de derechos humanos. Resulta curioso que casi todos los países que mencionó han sido o son víctimas de medidas coercitivas y acciones de injerencia política por parte de los Estados Unidos. El secretario de Estado olvidó expresar su preocupación por el criminal e ilegal bloqueo económico, comercial y financiero impuesto por su país contra Cuba, que tiene más de 60 años provocando privaciones y sufrimiento a la población cubana y afecta todas las esferas de la vida nacional. El bloqueo es el principal obstáculo al desarrollo de Cuba y una violación masiva y flagrante de los derechos humanos de los cubanos, lo que es denunciado año tras año por la comunidad internacional. Estados Unidos olvidó expresar preocupación por el impacto de las 243 medidas adicionales de recrudecimiento del bloqueo, muchas de ellas impuestas durante la pandemia de COVID-19 por parte de la anterior administración republicana y que la actual administración demócrata ha mantenido intactas y en plena aplicación, contradiciendo incluso las promesas hechas durante la campaña electoral presidencial. Estados Unidos olvidó asumir la responsabilidad directa de funcionarios de su gobierno y congresistas en el estímulo y organización de graves hechos de violencia en Cuba durante el pasado año e intentos fallidos de desestabilización política. Olvidó asumir su responsabilidad por la impunidad ante la financiación y promoción de actos terroristas contra, nuestra, contra nuestro país desde la Florida, todo lo cual Cuba denunció en su momento de manera contundente e irrefutable. Rechazo categóricamente los irrespetuosos comentarios sobre Cuba de la presidenta de la mal llamada Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. Siguen malgastando tiempo y recursos en su obsesión enfermiza con Cuba. Cuba no pertenece ni pertenecerá jamás a ningún órgano, mecanismo o instrumento de la OEA, cómplice directo de las más graves violaciones a la democracia y a los derechos humanos en nuestro continente. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Tiene la palabra China. Chi 和发展成果更多更公平汇集全体人民中国人权事业取得的历史性成就有目共睹已有来自一百多个国家的两千多位专家记者外交官宗教界人士参访新疆他们目睹了新疆社会安定经济发展人民幸福的真实情况中方欢迎人权高专巴切莱特女士近期访华并参访新疆同时我们坚决反对有些国
企图破坏中国稳定，遏制中国发展。这再次说明，人权只不过是他们进行政治攻击的工具。这些国家，种族歧视和排外主义根深蒂固，肆意侵犯难民、移民和少数族裔权利，滥施单边强制措施。美国历史上对印第安人实行种族灭绝，在国外肆意杀害别国平民，犯下严重罪行，却把自己包装成为人权卫士，这是何等的荒谬和虚伪！中国日前发表《二零二一年美国侵犯人权报告》，美国对印第安人实施种族灭绝的历史事实和现实证据，大家可以查阅。我们敦促上述国家改邪归正，停止。将人权作为干涉别国的政治工具，停止侵犯别国人民人权。谢谢主席先生。Thank you. Uh, ahora tiene la palabra Armenia, seguido por Siria. Armenia, por favor. President, Armenia requested the floor to exercise its right of reply to Azerbaijan. In September 2020, Azerbaijan unleashed an aggression against Nagorno-Karabakh. It perpetrated ethnic cleansing over the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh it captured, invaded, and occupied sovereign territories of the Republic of Armenia. That is a blatant breach of the Charter of the United Nations. Its purposes and principles of peaceful settlement of disputes, prevention and removal of threats to the peace, and refraining from the use of force. Azerbaijan's conduct testified that it is a serial violator of the international law. We recall the UN Resolution 3314, which defines aggression and furthermore stipulates that it is the duty of states not to use armed forces to deprive peoples of their right to self-determination. That is exactly what Azerbaijan has been doing against the people of Nagorno-Karabakh for more than three decades. During and after aggression, Azerbaijan committed gross violations of the international humanitarian law and of the international human rights law. It indiscriminately targeted civilian facilities such as residences, schools, markets and hospitals, causing enormous suffering and civilian casualties. The cases of extrajudicial executions, decapitations, mutilations, cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment were documented by such organizations as Belling, Cat, Human... Um, ah, uh, Human Rights Watch, Freedom House, and Amnesty International. Today, Azerbaijan brazenly violates the IHL by keeping under its custody the Armenian prisoners of war. It refuses to cooperate with the European Court of Human Rights on letters interim measures for those detainees. There are dozens of documented cases of enforced disappearances. Hundreds of missing persons came to add to a thousand from the first Nagorno-Karabakh war. Forty thousand Armenians. Para distinguir la delegación de Armenia, si pueden, if you can conclude your statement, please. Again? If you can conclude your statement, it's over the time. Si puede concluir su... su está fuera de ti. Of course. Us. So, the peace in Nagorno-Karabakh should be built on the premises of justice, accountability, and respect to international law. It should fully take into account the human rights of the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. I thank you. Tiene la palabra la delegación de Siria, seguida de Japón. التي تستغل منبر المجلس لممارسة التضليل والخداع وتشويه الحقائق فيما يتعلق بالأوضاع في جمهورية العربية السورية وذلك بعد الفشل الذريع لتلك الحكومات في تحقيق أي من أهداف حربها القذرة باستخدام الإرهاب والحصار الاقتصادي وممارسة العدوان للنيل من الدولة السورية يعلم وزير الخارجية الفرنسي جيدا أن اتهاماته بقصف المدنيين في إدلب لا أساس لها من الصحة وأن أهداف الحكومة السورية تنصب على تحرير إدلب وحماية سكانها من جرائم التنظيمات الإرهابية التابعة للقاعدة ومن احتلال داعميها الأتراك ومشغليهم الإقليميين 
ويعلم الوزير الفرنسي جيدا أن مزاعمه حول عودة السوريين المهجرين إلى وطنهم لا تتسق مع الواقع وأن المشكلة الحقيقية تكمن في إصرار الحكومة الفرنسية والحكومات الحليفة لها على منع عودة المهجرين السوريين إلى بلدهم خدمة لأغراضها السياسية وأن التدابير القسرية الأحادية التي تفرضها هذه الحكومات على الشعب السوري هي المسؤولة عن عرقلة جهود الحكومة السورية للتعافي من النتائج الاقتصادية والمعيشية للأزمة وتسهيل عودة السوريين المهجرين ويعلم الوزير فرنسي جيدا أن مزاعم استخدام الأسلحة الكيميائية باتت أسطوانة دعائية مشروخة لا قيمة لها وأن الحكومة السورية لا تمتلك أي أسلحة كيميائية منذ انضمامها عام 2013 إلى اتفاقية الأسلحة الكيميائية وأود اغتنام الفرصة هنا لأجدد إدانة الحكومة السورية لاستخدام الأسلحة الكيميائية في أي مكان وزمان وتحت أي ظرف كان بما في ذلك إدانتها لاستخدام فرنسا للأسلحة الكيميائية في مستعمراتها السابقة لأغراض تجربة تلك الأسلحة أو في مواجهة حركات التحرر الوطني للتخلص من الاستعمار الفرنسي لتلك الدول سيد الرئيس إن كيان الاحتلال الإسرائيلي صاحب السجل الأكبر في ارتكاب الجرائم والانتهاكات لحقوق الإنسان هو آخر من يحق له الحديث عن المشروعية وشرعية الوجود في هذه القاعة ومما لا شك فيه أن قناع الإنسانية الزائف الذي حاولت ممثلة كيان الاحتلال الإسرائيلي ومعها ممثلة النظام التركي وضعه في هذه القاعة لا يليق بكل النظامين وتاريخهما في ممارسة العدوان وإرهاب الدولة ولن يغير بحال من الأحوال وجه الاحتلال الإسرائيلي والتركي القبيح الذي تناوله بيان وزير خارجيتنا أمام هذا المجلس شكرا سيد الرئيس Gracias. Tiene la palabra Japón, seguido de Argentina. Thank you, Mr. President. Delegation of Japan uh, would like uh, to respond uh, to the statement uh, by the Republic of Korea. Japan has made uh, its uh, utmost efforts to address the comfort women issue, which has been a significant diplomatic issue between Japan and the ROK since 1990. In the first place, the issues relating to the property and the claims between Japan and the ROK, including the issue of comfort women, were already completely and finally resolved with the agreement on the settlement of problems concerning property and claims and on economic cooperation of 1965. On top of that, from the perspective of providing pra practical support, the Asian Women's Fund was established under the cooperation of the people and the government of Japan in 1995 and has provided women affected from Korea and other Asian countries with atonement money, as well as medical and welfare support, together with a letter of apology from the Prime Minister. To add to these measures, in December 2015, the government of uh, both countries, after extensive diplomatic efforts, reached an agreement confirming that uh, the comfort women issue had been finally and irreversibly resolved, and also confirming that Japan and the ROK will refrain from blaming or criticizing each other on this issue in the international arena, including at the UN. In the follow-up to the agreement, the government of Japan made a payment of 1 billion yen to the Foundation for Reconciliation and Healing established by the ROK. As the foundation provided financial support to 35 of the 47 former comfort women who were arrived at the time of the agreement and to the uh, bereaved fa families of 64 of the 199 former comfort women who were deceased at the time. And uh, this has been appreciated by many former comfort women. However, in 2018, the ROK uh, unilaterally announced that it will pursue the dissolution of the foundation. Uh, and this announcement is problematic and un unacceptable in light of the agreement. Japan has implemented all measures uh, uh, committed under the uh, agreement. It, it is important that the ROK uh, steadily implement the uh, uh, agreement uh, 
committed by the two countries and appreciated by the international co community. I thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. President. Thank you. Tiene la palabra Argentina. Gracias, señor presidente. En respuesta a la intervención pronunciada por la delegación del Reino Unido, Gran Bretaña y Irlanda del Norte, la República Argentina rechaza todas y cada una de las afirmaciones de la referida réplica británica. Reitera todos los términos y argumentaciones expuestos en la intervención del Ministro de Relaciones Exteriores, eh, Santiago Cafiero, durante su discurso ante este Consejo el pasado 28 de febrero, y reafirma que las Islas Malvinas, Georgias del Sur, Sandwich del Sur y los espacios marítimos circundantes forman parte integrante del territorio nacional argentino y que hallándose ilegítimamente, ilegítimamente ocupadas por el Reino Unido desde 1833, son objeto de una disputa de soberanía reconocida por las Naciones Unidas, que califica la cuestión Malvinas como un caso especial y particular de descolonización. La Argentina lamenta la interpretación errónea realizada por el Reino Unido respecto de los hechos ocurridos en 1833, con el objetivo de justificar una ocupación ilegal que desde su inicio ha sido objeto de continuas y reiteradas protestas por parte de la Argentina. Desde la época de la colonización de América, las Islas Malvinas han estado sujetas a dominio español, hecho que fue reconocido por las demás potencias coloniales de aquellos tiempos, entre ellas el Reino Unido. En el marco del proceso de reestructuración administrativa de sus posiciones en América, España creó el Virreinato del, Reino del Río de la Plata en 1776. Dicho virreinato ejerció efectivamente su jurisdicción sobre las islas, de manera pacífica e ininterrumpida, desde su creación hasta la independencia de la República Argentina. Así, la República Argentina, como legítima heredera de España, la sucedió en sus derechos en 1810, tomó posesión de las Islas Malvinas en 1820 y ejerció su autoridad efectiva y continua sobre las islas y los espacios marítimos circundantes hasta que fue expulsada por la fuerza en 1833 por parte del Reino Unido, que nunca ha podido ostentar un título válido de soberanía sobre las islas. La subvasión, la subvasión británica llevada a cabo en tiempos de paz y contraria al derecho internacional vigente en la época representó un quebrantamiento de la integridad territorial argentina, siendo protestada de forma inmediata y nunca consentida por mi país. Señor Presidente, el principio de libre determinación de los pueblos no es aplicable en este caso y las Naciones Unidas jamás han establecido que los habitantes de las Islas Malvinas sean titulares del derecho a la libre determinación. La invocación de un pretendido derecho a la autodeterminación por parte de la población de las islas es inaplicable al caso en cuestión y ha sido reiteradamente rechazada por Naciones Unidas porque la organización entendió que una población trasplantada por la potencia colonial, como es la población de las islas, no es un pueblo con, libre, con derecho a la libre determinación ya que, se diferencia del, ya que no se diferencia del pueblo de la metrópoli. En tal sentido, no existe aquí un pueblo sojuzgado, dominado o subyugado a una potencia colonial. Ninguna de las diez resoluciones de la Asamblea General o de las resoluciones del Comité Especial de Descolonización relativas a la cuestión de las Islas Malvinas hace referencia a dicho principio. Más aún, la Asamblea General expresamente rechazó en dos oportunidades en 1985 propuestas británicas para incorporar el principio de libre determinación en el proyecto de resolución sobre la cuestión de las Islas Malvinas. La realización de una votación entre los ciudadanos británicos que residen en las islas en nada altera la existencia de la disputa de soberanía en la cuestión de las Islas Malvinas. La votación unilateralmente convocada por, favor, por el Reino Unido Argentina. en 2013 no fue organizada ni realizada bajo los auspicios de Naciones Unidas. De modo que, Argentina, además de absolutamente... Gracias. Tiene la palabra Mauricio, seguido de Pakistán. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I take the floor following the right of reply exercised by the delegation of the United Kingdom. In its judgment of 28 January 2021, the Special Chamber of Itlos ruled that Mauritius had undisputed sovereignty over the Chagos archipelago. It also ruled that the UK's continued claim to sovereignty over the Chagos archipelago is contrary to the authoritative determinations of the International Court of Justice, that the Chagos archipelago was unlawfully detached from Mauritius, and that the UK's continued administration of the Chagos archipelago constitutes an unlawful act of a continuing character. These authoritative determinations in, view, in the view of the Special Chamber have legal effect. We fail to understand how the UK continues to maintain that it has sovereignty over the Chagos archipelago when 28 international judges and arbitrators have had the opportunity to address the question of which state has sovereignty over the Chagos archipelago 
and none of them has offered support for the UK's position, which is entirely without merit and untenable. As regards the rights of the Mauritians, who were the former inhabitants of the Chagos archipelago, the ICJ ruled in its advisory opinion that the resettlement on the Chagos archipelago of Mauritian nationals, including those of Chagosian origin, is an issue relating to the protection of the human rights of those concerns, of those concerned, sorry, which needs to be addressed by the UN. Before ruling, as it did, the ICJ highlighted the UK's acceptance during the proceedings that I quote, the manner in which the Chagossians were removed from the Chagos archipelago and the way they were treated thereafter was shameful and wrong and that the UK deeply regrets that fact, unquote. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Tiene la palabra Pakistán, seguido de Irán. Thank you, Mr. President. I am exercising our right to reply to reject India's fallacious statement. The Indian rep representative has once again chosen to repackage its disinformation against Pakistan, already exposed in detail by the independent EU disinfo lab. Let be there no mistake, India's dubious assertions reflect its desperate attempt to deflect global scrutiny of its criminal human rights record, both in occupied Kashmir and on its mainland. It is hardly any surprise that the RSS BJP terror regime would go to any extent to deploy deceit and deception to target my country. After all, this fascist regime, by mainstreaming hatred against Pakistan Muslims, seeks to win elections. How else can this absolute silence of Indian leadership be explained in face of the public calls for genocide of Muslims in Hardiwar and systematic attacks on Muslim women and girls wearing hijab in Karnataka? What else independent observers can expect from the instigators of anti-Muslim violence and pogroms, who now hold some of the highest public offices of the Chief Minister, Home Minister, and Prime Minister? Mr. President, let us be very clear. Occupied Jammu and Kashmir never was and never will be the so-called integral part of India. Under international law, India is an illegal occupier of a UN-recognized disputed territory. India's unlawful actions imposed upon the Kashmiri people by the barrel of guns since 5th August have only revalidated its status as an illegal occupier. That is why the Security Council has met thrice since 5th August to consider the extremely worrying situation in the occupied territory. That is why the UN position on Jammu and Kashmir has been publicly reaffirmed by UN Secretary General. That is why UN special procedures have publicly warned about the devastating human rights impacts of India's demographic engineering. And that is why Jammu and Kashmir remains on the Security Council's agenda. Mr. President, India must end its self-serving policy of running with the rabbits and hunting with the hounds when it comes to terrorism. India has a dubious distinction of being one of the world's pioneers and largest purveyors of state terrorism. It has instigated, sponsored, and abetted state terrorism in each of its neighboring countries, including against my country. At home, the Hindutva regime is unleashing the worst form of state-directed terrorism against its minority population and civil society. Anyone daring dissent against BJP, RSS, uh, Nazi-inspired policies, practices, and laws is brand branded as terrorist and muzzled. With such horrendous track record on democracy, rule of law, and human rights, India surely does not deserve a place at this council and in the wider law-abiding world community. Mr. President, India is well advised to introspect, set its own house in order, and abide by its international obligations. As a first step, India must accept an international commission of inquiry in Jammu and Kashmir. We dare ask India if it has nothing to hide, why it continues to deny access to OHCHR, UN Special Procedures, Global Civil Society, and media to the occupied territory. I thank you. Thank you. Tiene la palabra Irán, seguido de Argelia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Are you hearing me, Will? Sí. Yes, we, we can hear you and see Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, I requested to exercise right of reply to respond to allegations against my delegation by representatives of Israel. My delegation is not surprised by the Israeli regime's representative remarks. They always abuse this august body to normalize their atrocities and their apartheid criminal posture. The regime is best characterized under UNGA Resolution 3379 of 10 November 1975, has no moral ground to talk about the concept of human rights in, in this August Council. We urgently uh, believe that the Council's Agenda Item 7, which follows uh, up the, on the right of innocent Palestinian women, girls, and children who have been killed by the Israeli regime, is vital. In this line, this council should ensure that the com Commission of Inquiry uh, could fulfill its mandate, including through being provided with uh, necessary resources. I should stress that a regime that has been established based on occupying others' lands and continues its uh, military aggressions uh, and all uh, other atrocities against the occupied Palestine, Palestinian people and other countries has no legitimacy to speak about the human rights situation in, in my country. We urge everybody in this council to have a look to the recent report on Israeli apartheid against Palestinians as a cruel system of domination of, and crime against humanity. We must be aware that past atrocities do not authorize the uh, alleged victims to take revenge from other nations by resorting to unlawfully occupation of their lands, committing genocide and other atrocities as an accuse to achieve a re uh, restorative justice. I thank you, Mr. President. Tiene la palabra Argelia. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, durant le segment de haut niveau, le représentant de l'autoproclamé commandeur des croyants a consacré le tiers de son intervention à l'attaque de mon pays, pour la simple raison que l'Algérie se montre attachée à la légalité internationale, solidaire d'un peuple qui refuse l'occupation et le fait accompli de la colonisation et qui demande depuis plus de quatre décennies l'organisation d'un référendum d'autodétermination en faveur du peuple de ce territoire enregistré au niveau des Nations Unies comme un territoire à décoloniser. Il est affligeant que le représentant de la monarchie marocaine s'est évertué à donner à notre plénière une image idéalement satisfaisante des performances de son pays, alors que depuis des semaines, les manifestants occupent, occupent les espaces publics de 50 villes marocaines pour dénoncer la rapine, la prédation et l'injustice sociale, dévalisant les commerces alimentaires et réclamant le changement, événement passé sous silence, par un embargo dont les médias qui scrutent pourtant les horizons et qui se disent indépendants, si promptes à rapporter l'actualité du jour, font preuve d'une incroyable cécité. Nous savons tous que, le royaume, que ce royaume, faussement constitutionnel, maquille ses bilans, y compris ceux de droit de l'homme. Il traverse les réalités induites par l'occupation militaire d'un territoire pour lequel il ne dispose pas de titre de propriété et que lui a rappelé en maintes occasions la Cour de justice européenne dans ses récentes décisions. Il manipule l'opinion publique internationale, réprime violemment ses opposants, y compris par sa police numérique, et espionne, grâce au sinistre logiciel Pegasus, ses propres alliés, dont ceux ici de la place diplomatique de Genève. En somme, il a construit et monté, comme tout le reste du château, une industrie du mensonge adossée à une machine à Odima pour s'assurer la complaisance de ses protecteurs en vue de favoriser, comme c'est le cas depuis quatre décennies, l'inaction des organes de délibération et de sanction des Nations Unies. Nous évoquons depuis des années ces faits pour appeler au sursaut des consciences et souligner notre collective responsabilité afin de mettre un terme à l'incongruité des formules concoctées par le Royaume du Maroc qui s'en détourne assume devant nous une agression caractérisée. Monsieur le Président, pour tout le reste, nous renvoyons l'orateur à l'aide mémoire circulée le 30 septembre 2021 par la mission d'Algérie aux représentations diplomatiques et aux organisations internationales à Genève et aux cinglins démentis en date du 17 janvier 22 du porte-parole du secrétaire général qui a balayé les allégations au sujet d'un prétendu enrôlement d'enfants réfugiés 
dans l'armée sahraoui. Je vous remercie. Merci. Tiene la palabra Marruecos. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Il en a vraiment de constater à nouveau que le délégué de l'Algérie use et abuse du temps de notre Conseil pour véhiculer des mensonges habituels et imaginaires concernant mon pays. Mais si vous permettez, je souhaiterais faire quelques commentaires. Le représentant de l'Algérie a cru devoir s'attaquer à mon pays comme à son habitude et à lui seul, isolé et désavoué dans des assertions qui ne trompent plus personne. Ma délégation a déjà dit à plusieurs reprises que le représentant de l'Algérie n'a aucune légitimité pour agir de la sorte étant la porte-voix d'un régime répressif connu de par le monde par sa politique arbitraire menée depuis des décennies. Je me limiterai à reprendre les dénonciations basées sur des arguments juridiques tels et comme ils ont été formulés par les organes des traités de ce Conseil, pas plus tard que le 27 décembre dernier, et qui ont mis le doigt sur ce qui suit. L'élaboration motivée d'une loi contre le terrorisme, qui en réalité n'a servi qu'à réprimer les manifestants pacifiques de Hirak et à faire taire les défenseurs des droits de l'homme au pays. Par ailleurs, nombreuses instances internationales, associations, ONG et défenseurs de liberté ne cessent de dénoncer les arrestations arbitraires et les jugements uniques qui ont concerné des centaines d'Algériens, y compris des juges et des magistrats. Pas plus tard que le 21 février 2022, Madame Laulor, représentante spéciale des défenseurs des droits de l'homme, s'est inquiétée via une déclaration des sorts réservés aux défenseurs des droits de l'homme en Algérie en exhortant les autorités à libérer les détenus immédiatement et sans délai. Cela, bien évidemment, sont comptés les procès expéditifs des anciens officiers du régime, dont certains condamnés à de lourdes peines ont été réhabilités sans aucune forme de procédure, ce qui met à nu les manipulations des systèmes judiciaires et le règlement de compte qui ne répond à aucune forme de justice. À l'intérieur même de la gérie des associations, des syndicats, des partis politiques ne cessent de dénoncer cette situation. Situation qui disqualifie le représentant de l'Algérie de façon totale et entière, ne lui permettant en aucune manière d'attaquer le Maroc, pays ancré dans l'état de droit ayant parachevé des réformes institutionnelles et légales qui ont fait un exemple de démocratisation connue et reconnue de tous. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci. Tiene la palabra... República Democrática de Corea. DPRK, you have the floor. Thank you, Thank you Mr. President. My delegation would like to exercise the right of reply to remarks by the United States, Australia, Japan, and now this to the high level segment. The allegations of DPRK are politically motivated in pursuit of the despicable purposes. Therefore, we categorically reject those accusations. The United States, with the worst human rights record in the world, talks this and that about human rights situation in other countries. That does not stand to reason at all. It is just the United States where human rights are mercilessly violated and people lose their lives, even at this moment, for the mere reason that they are of another race. It is also the United States where many women and girls are trampled down and their dignity and subjected to human trafficking. The United States and Australia are urged to mind itself before meddling in others by sincerely reflecting upon the various crimes and atrocities it committed before the world and humanity. Let me turn to abduction issue repeated by Japan. Explicitly speaking again, the abduction issue have, had already been settled in complete and irreversible manner. Nevertheless, it is the height of a shamelessness for Japan that is passes itself up as a victim of abduction to cover up heinous crimes committed in the past and to avoid its atonement. As tested by history, Japan is the worst war criminal state on record, which include the forcibly dropped more than <coughs> eight for 8.4 million Koreans and forcing 200,000 Korean women and the sexual slavery for imperial Japanese army. Japan is once again strongly urged to 
sees the useless act and sincerely reflect on the past crimes against humanity and make due reparation for them as it is legally and morally obliged to do so. Regarding the intercultural relations, it depends on the attitude of the South side whether the intercultural relations would be restored and developed on the new stage or continue to keep the present state of worsening. It is important for the South side to change its confrontational and habitual attitude toward our republic, keep the stand of national independence through practice, not with war, deal with intercultural relations with a view to settling the essential methods and keep weight and sincerely implement the implement this no such declaration. I thank you. Thank you. Ahora pasamos a la segundo segundo derecho de réplica y quiero recordar que para el segundo derecho de réplica las delegaciones tienen solamente dos minutos. Entonces, doy la palabra a la delegación de Cabo Verde. Tenha a palavra, por favor. Chairman, uh, the delegation of Cap Verde stands by the declaration it uh, just has made and reiterates that the state of Cap Verde respects its, its constitution, which effectively defends respect for the human rights of all people without distinction. Thank you. Obrigado. Tiene la palabra la República de Corea. Thank you, Mr. President. My delegation would like to exercise the second right of reply to the statement made by Japanese delegation. We will not repeat the point already made regarding the 2015 agreement. However, we would like to emphasize once again that the Comfort Women issue is essentially a serious human rights violation against women during wartime. In this regard, the Korean government has been taking a clear position that the Kampar women issue has not been resolved by the Claim Settlement Agreement of 1965. It is a historical fact that Kampar women victims were coerced into a miserable situation against their will. Not only was this testified by the victims themselves, but also admitted by the Japanese government in its official statement. Moreover, a number of UN human rights mechanisms have also confirmed the historical fact of the Kampar women victim. In this context, it is deeply regrettable that the Japanese government has dismissed the Korean government's will to draw historical lessons from the Kampar women issue as a mere accusation. Mr. President, after decades since the Kampar women victim broke silence, this issue remained unresolved, and the immeasurable pain and suffering of the victim has yet to be addressed even to this very day. We call on Japan to heed the voice of the victim and address this issue as a matter of universal human right. By doing so, we will be able to provide future generations with a historical lesson in order to prevent the reoccurrence of this tragedy. I thank you. Gracias. And now I give the floor to the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. President. The United Kingdom wishes to exercise a second right of reply to Argentina and Mauritius. As stated, the United Kingdom has no doubt about its sovereignty over the Falkland Islands and South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands and the surrounding maritime areas of both territories. The legal and historical position on this is clear. Mr. President, 2022 marks the 40th anniversary of the illegal Argentine invasion of the Falkland Islands and the subsequent liberation of the islands by a UK task force. This anniversary provides an opportunity to acknowledge the sacrifice of those who died in the conflict from both sides and also the island's development since 1982. Today, the Falkland Islands are a successful multicultural democracy. With regard to the further statement by Mauritius, the UK wishes to repeat that we have no doubt over our sovereignty over the Chagos archipelago, which, as we noted previously, has been under continuous British sovereignty since 1814. The UK is aware of the judgment delivered on 28 January 2021 by the Special Chamber of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. However, the UK is not a party to these proceedings, which can have no effect for the UK or for maritime delimitation between the UK in respect to the British Indian Ocean Territory and the Republic of the Maldives. 
Mr. President, General Assembly Resolution 73-295, adopted following the ICJ's advisory opinion, does not and cannot create any legal obligations for UN member states. Neither the non-binding advisory opinion nor the non-binding General Assembly Resolution alter the legal situation. Mr. President, despite the ongoing bilateral sovereignty dispute, the UK and Mauritius remain close friends and Commonwealth partners, and we remain open to dialogue on all shared areas, such shared issues of mutual interest. And as previously noted, we have a long-standing commitment, first made in 1965, to cede sovereignty of the archipelago to Mauritius when it is no longer required for defence purposes. We stand by that commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Je donne la parole à la Algérie. Monsieur le Président, la question du Sahara occidental est, est un trou noir dans l'histoire de la décolonisation que les Nations unies ont le devoir de parachever. Il s'agit d'un véritable bug diplomatique où les approches politiciennes primaires, le cynisme et la passivité coupable ont pris le pas sur les souffrances d'un peuple dont on cherche par l'usure à changer les attitudes, les comportements et les convictions. Cette incivilité diplomatique et non seulement oublieuse d'un vaste exposé historique de la vraie vie, des vrais gens, mais elle cherche à entraîner l'organisation des Nations Unies dans une réécriture et un modèle de pensée où l'agresseur cherche et tente à se sentir légitime parmi nous. Monsieur le Président, avec son infinie rhétorique, le Royaume du Maroc tente depuis plus de quatre décennies de développer à l'endroit de la communauté internationale une matrice des idées et un schéma où il assume outrageusement le non-respect de la règle de droit et la violation de la légalité internationale. J'aimerais rappeler au plénipotentiaire du Royaume, au cas où la mémoire serait oublieuse, qu'à la faveur de l'accord diplomatique du 28 mai 56 signé avec la France, son pays déclaré au titre de la succession assurait, je cite, les obligations résultant des traités internationaux passés par la France au nom du Maroc, ainsi que celles qui résultent des actes internationaux relatifs au Maroc, qui n'ont pas fait ou donné lieu à des observations de sa part. Or, le Royaume, au moment de son accession à l'indépendance, n'a jamais fait aucune observation sur les conventions franco-espagnoles relatives au, stat au statut du Sahara occidental. Monsieur le Président, l'Algérie a foi en le multilatéralisme, raison pour laquelle elle a fait et continuera de faire le plaidoyer des causes justes des peuples opprimés et des communautés sans voix. Sa trajectoire historique et son ADN le lui dictent. Elle ne cautionnera pas la radicalité de la position de l'agresseur euh, et ne s'accommodera jamais euh, de l'échec de la... Pardon, conclure le système. Merci. Tiene la palabra Argentina, seguida de Mauricio. Argentina. Gracias, señor presidente. La República Argentina rechaza todas y cada una de las afirmaciones contenidas en la intervención británica. Reiteramos todos los términos y argumentaciones oportunamente expuestos en este Consejo y reafirmamos que las Islas Malvinas, Georgia del Sur, Sandwich del Sur y los espacios marítimos circundantes forman parte integrante del territorio nacional, hallando ilegítimamente ocupadas por el Reino Unido. Y son además objeto de una disputa de soberanía reconocida por las Naciones Unidas, que reitero, califica la cuestión Malvinas como un caso especial y particular de descolonización. La Asamblea General de Naciones Unidas se pronunció a través de la resolución 2065 instando a la Argentina y el Reino Unido a reanudar las negociaciones a fin de encontrar a la mayor brevedad posible una solución pacífica a la disputa de soberanía sobre las islas, lo cual fue reiterado en sus resoluciones subsiguientes y en las resoluciones del Comité de Descolonización. Existe la obligación que recae sobre todos los miembros de los Estados miembros de conformidad con la Carta de Naciones Unidas de venirse a solucionar pacíficamente sus disputas así como de negociar de buena fe. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Tiene la palabra Mauricio, seguido de Japón. President, I take the floor to exercise a second right of reply following the second right of reply exercised by the delegation of the United Kingdom. The position taken by the United Kingdom in respect of the Chagos archipelago is in manifest breach of international law including its legally binding obligations thereunder, as clearly set out in the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice of 25th February 2019, UN General Assembly Resolution 73295, and the judgment 
of the Special Chamber of ITLOS of 28 January 2021. It is clear that as a matter of international law, the Chagos Archipelago forms an integral part of the territory of Mauritius. The judgment of the Special Chamber of ITLOS is binding under international law as it gives effect to and applies the advisory opinion of the ICJ. This judgment has also confirmed the illegality of the so-called British Indian Ocean Territory. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Tiene la palabra Japón, seguido de Marruecos. Japón, por favor. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to exercise the, the second right of the reply uh, uh, to the statements uh, by the Republic of Korea and the DPRK. I will not repeat here what uh, I already said. The government of Japan has sincerely dealt with the uh, issue of comfort to women. Japan would like to stress uh, that uh, President Moon Jae-in himself acknowledged that this agreement is an official uh, agreement between the two governments and Japan has implemented all measures it committed under the agreement of uh, 2015. It is important that the ROK government steadily implemented the agreement, a promise made by uh, between the two countries. On the issue of abductions, the claims by the DPRK are based on erroneous recognition. Under the Stockholm Agreement of uh, 2014, uh, not, notwithstanding its uh, position, the DPRK uh, promised to uh, carry out a comprehensive and thorough investigation on all Japanese national concerns, including abductees. The victims and the, their families are now well advanced in age. In February 2020, Arimoto, uh, Arimoto Kayako, mother of the victim, uh, Arimoto Keiko, passed away. In June 2020, Mr. Yokota Shikeru, father of Yokota Megumi, also passed away. In December 2021, Mr. Izuka Shingo, brother of the victim Taguchi Aiko and former head of the Association of uh, Family of Victims, also passed away. The, the issue of abduction must be resolved without further delay. We urge the DPRK to implement the agreement and return all the abductees to Japan as quickly as possible. DPRK should listen sincerely to the call of the international community, including the resolution on the human rights situation in DPRK, and take concrete action towards the early settlement of the abduction issue and cooperation with the international community. The claims and the figures that the DPRK mentioned regarding Japan are based on factual errors and groundless. Excuse we me, like the time is up. That, uh, okay. Mr. Delegate, thank you. Tiene la palabra Marruecos, seguido de República Democrática de Corea. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma délégation s'attache à l'esprit constructif et serein de débat au sein de, de ce Conseil et n'a nullement l'intention de verser dans un débat, dans un débat stérile, voire dans l'infective qui ne déshonore que son auteur. Mais permettez-moi, puisque la question de Sahara a été abordée à nouveau euh, de manière maladive de délégués algériens, je lui rappelle que la situation au Sahara euh, est, est des plus sereins et des plus stables, et les droits sont mieux respectés dans la plupart des provinces sud du Maroc, mieux que certains pays, certaines villes en Algérie. La preuve, s'il en faut une, c'est que des séparatistes se permettent de se rendre ici même à Genève avec un passeport marocain sans s'inquiéter, contrairement aux opposants algériens qui subissent les plus atroces des violations de leurs droits et donc quitter le territoire algérien relève de l'utopie sous un régime qualifié de plus totalitariste et répressif à l'échelle mondiale où les richesses du pays sont dilapidées pour entretenir le séparatisme et l'instabilité dans la région. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Merci. Tiene la palabra la República Democrática de Corea. Por Zoom. Thank you, Mr. President. The DPRK delegation would like to exercise the <coughs> second right to reply to remarks by Japan, delegate of Japan. <coughs> Sorry. The liquidation of past crimes is an unavoidable legal and moral obligation of Japan <clears throat> and strong demand of the international community. In the history of World War, 
Japan is an overly criminal state that horribly violated the dignity and fundamental rights of hundreds of thousands of women, including teenage girls, to the battlefield as sexual slavery. However, Japan has denied or even beautified the cruel history of crimes in the past. Japan can never evade of its historical, legal, and moral responsibility for its crimes by what so ever. We reiterate that there is no statute of limitations for crimes against humanity committed by Japan in the past, and that those crimes should be held accountable. Should Japan have a piece of conscience and morality in deflecting its past crimes, it should pay heed to voice of outcry of the victims and survivors of sexual slavery who have been cruelly violated their dignity and fundamental right and should come forth with a sincere apology and compensation before late. I thank you. Muchas gracias. Con no habiendo más peticiones de palabra, cerraré ahora el segmento de alto nivel y el segmento general del 49 o periodo de sesiones del Consejo de Derechos Humanos. Nos tomaremos un minuto, máximo dos, para comenzar luego con el debate urgente que tenemos pendiente. Gracias.
Tal y como decidió el Consejo el pasado lunes 28 de febrero, ahora celebraremos el debate urgente sobre, cito, la situación de los derechos humanos en Ucrania derivada de la agresión rusa. Fin de cita. Como recordarán, el 25 de febrero de 2022 recibí una carta de Ucrania con la petición formal de celebrar este debate urgente. El proyecto de resolución titulado, cito, situación de los derechos humanos en Ucrania como consecuencia de la agresión rusa, fin de cita, fue distribuido a todas las delegaciones. Les recuerdo que la lista de oradores se abrió el martes a las 14 horas y se cerrará dentro de 15 minutos. Permítanme recordar una vez más que este debate urgente seguirá las mismas modalidades que un debate general del Consejo de Derechos Humanos. El tiempo de intervención será de dos minutos y medio para los miembros y un minuto y medio para todos los observadores. Hago un llamamiento a todas las delegaciones para que respeten este límite de tiempo. Sin más preámbulos, cedo la palabra a la señora Michelle Bachelet, alta comisionada para los derechos humanos, para que haga su declaración. Señora, tiene usted la palabra. Thank you, Mr. President. Distinguished President, Excellencies, colleagues and friends. One week ago, the Russian Federation's military attack on Ukraine opened the new and dangerous chapter in world history. The Secretary General has termed this, and I will quote him, the most serious global peace and security crisis in recent years. He added, a country has been thrown into chaos, a region, a region has been upended, and the reverberations are being felt around the world, end of quote. The attack that began on 24 February is generating massive impact on the human rights of millions of people across Ukraine. Elevated threat levels for nuclear power weapons underline the gravity of the risk to all of humanity. Military operations are escalating further as we speak, with military strikes on and near large cities including Chernihiv, Kharkiv, Kherson, Lysyshansk, Sivirodonetsk, Sumy, Mariupol, and Shitomir, and the capital Kiev. The town of Volnovaya in Donetsk region has been almost completely destroyed by shelling and its remaining residents have been hiding in basements. By Tuesday night, my office has recorded and confirmed 752 civilian casualties, including 2020, 2027 killed 15 of them children. At least 525 have been injured, including 28 children. I will um, uh, disaggregate this information a little bit on the regions in, uh, affected. Of those uh, 752 civilians, 323 casualties, 65 killed and 258 injured were recorded in Donetsk and Luhansk regions. 429 casualties, 162 killed and 267 injured were recorded in other regions of Ukraine, in the city of Kiev and Cherkasy, Chernihiv, Kharkiv, Kherson, Kiev, Odessa, Sumy, Saporizhia, and Shitomi regions. I must emphasize that the real figures, figures will be far higher since numerous other casualties are pending confirmation and information from some areas engaged in intense hostilities have been delayed. A member of the OSCE monitoring unit in Ukraine was killed last night in Kharkiv while getting supplies for her family. We, we grieve all the deaths that have occurred. Most civilian casualties were caused by the use of heavy artillery, multi-launch rocket systems and airstrikes in populated areas with concerning reports of use of cluster munitions striking civilian targets. Massive damage to residential buildings has been inflicted. The use of weapons with wide area effects in populated urban areas risk being inherently indiscriminate and I call for the immediate cessation of such force. There has also been substantial damage to a significant number of civilian objects, including a hospital, schools, and kindergartens. Essential infrastructure has been heavily damaged, cutting off critical supplies and services, including electricity, water, and access to healthcare. On the 26th of February, 
Russian troops near Kherson reportedly fired on an ambulance that was transporting seriously wounded victims. The driver was killed and one paramedic was injured. Over two million people have been forced to flee their homes. One million, according to UNHCR estimates, are internally displaced. A further 1,040,000 refugees have sought safety in neighboring countries in the past seven days, often after traveling for days by bicycle or on foot in freezing conditions. UNHCR has estimated that up to 4 million people could leave the country in the coming weeks if the conflict continues. I commend the welcome that Ukrainians leaving the country have received. This welcome must be extended to all those fleeing conflict regardless of their citizenship, ethnicity, migration, or other status. There has been disturbing indications of discrimination against African and Asian nationals while fleeing, and the office will be watching this situation attentively. Tens of millions of people remain in the country in potentially mortal danger. I'm deeply concerned that the current escalation of military operations will further heighten the harm they face. Thousands of people, including older people, pregnant women, as well as children and people with disabilities, are being forced to gather in underground shelters and subway stations to escape explosion. Many people in situations of vulnerability are separated from families and effectively trapped. My staff in Ukraine have been contacted by several groups who fear persecution if Russian troops advance, including members of the Crimean Tatar community in mainland Ukraine, as well as prominent human rights defenders and journalists. Excellencies, we are here to demonstrate and uphold our commitment to multilateralism and human rights. I echo the powerful call by the General Assembly yesterday for an immediate resolution of the conflict through peaceful means. State must abide by international law and the core principles that protect human life and human dignity. It is imperative that full access for the delivery of humanitarian assistance to civilians across the entire country be enabled. I also strongly urge the full protection of civilians, as well as captured soldiers, as required under international humanitarian law. It is a reality that in armed conflict there are incidents that violate the binding norms of international armed conflict. It is in all states' interest to ensure that those standards are met and there is due accountability where they are not. I know that at the international level, the International Court of Justice have been formally seized of proceedings connected to the conflict and will begin hearings Monday on a request for professional measures. measures. In addition, the prosecutor in the International Criminal Court has announced his decision to immediately proceed with active investigations on the situation in the Ukraine following referrals by, the broad, by a broad number of states. And this council has before it an important proposal, building on established practice to widen accountability avenues through an independent international commission of inquiry. The office has for eight years extensively and consistently monitored the human rights situation in Ukraine. We particularly focus on the regions of the Donbass engaged in conflict as well as the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sebastopol, which has been occupied by the Russian Federation since 2014. The 40 reports the office has published are publicly accessible and document violations of international human rights and humanitarian law by multiple actors over the period. Our human rights monitor will continue to operate across the country to the, fel the, to the full extent of their capacity. I believe this crisis demonstrates the vital importance of our objective monitoring and reporting in Ukraine and in many other countries. And I take this opportunity <clears throat> to publicly thank the staff of the office, particularly our colleagues in the field, for their dedication. Excellencies, as the Secretary General has said, the UN Charter has always, and I will quote him, stood firm on the side of peace, security, development, justice, international law, and human rights. And time after time, when the international community has rallied together in solidarity, those values have prevailed, end of quote. It is vital that they prevail today in Ukraine and elsewhere. My thoughts are with all people who suffer unbearable pa fear, pain, and deprivation because of the senseless destruction of warfare. I thank you, Mr. President. Muchas gracias. Tiene la palabra ahora el señor Víctor Madrigal Borlós, Presidente del Comité de Coordinación de Procedimientos Especiales, vía Zoom. 
Gracias, señor presidente. ¿Me escucha bien? Sí, perfecto. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, excellencies, I'm delivering this statement on behalf of the Coordination Committee of Special Procedures. As the world continues to watch with despair the disastrous impact of the military attack of the Russian Federation on Ukraine, we salute the decision of the Human Rights Council to hold this urgent debate. In the wake of the decision of the United Nations General Assembly to deplore in the strongest terms the aggression by the Russian Federation against Ukraine in violation of Article 2, 4 of the Charter, it is now up to this Council to put human rights squarely in the response to the crisis and contribute to an immediate ceasefire, a de-escalation of tensions and a firm return to diplomacy and dialogue. My colleagues and I, Mr. President, are ready to continue assisting this Council and the parties concerned today and in the weeks to come. Throughout their history, the special procedures of the United Nations Human Rights Council have gathered and made available to the members of the Council persuasive evidence of the inextricable connection between armed conflict and human rights violations. That evidence convinces us of the urgent relevance of assessing this situation through the, that lens. The furtherance of human rights depends on the respect of fundamental rules of international law an order that flows from the United Nations Charter. This is no doubt the reason why, over the last few days, you have heard the human rights community coalesce around the defense of that order. Last Monday, 63 human rights experts appointed by this Council and the chairs of six of the United Nations human rights treaty bodies expressed in unison our profound outrage and distress at the aggression by the forces of the Russian Federation against the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine and all peoples under the Ukrainian jurisdiction. This military attack, which flagrantly violates international law and strikes at the very heart of the spirit and object of the Charter, is fundamentally an attack on the order that enables our work to further human rights and their objective to promote the respect of human dignity. Excellencies, that human rights should be respected when armed conflict is happening in the foreground is not a theoretical construct. It is painfully concrete to the hundreds who have been killed and wounded as a result of the military attack and their loved ones. Between 24 February morning and the midnight on the 1st of March, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has recorded 752 civilian casualties. This include 227 killed among them 15 children and 525 injured, among them 28 children. Most of these casualties were caused using explosive weapons with a wide impact area, including shelling from heavy artillery and multiple launch rocket systems and airstrikes, which should not be used in populated areas. These are, are, I must add, only the casualties OHCHR was able to verify through our colleagues in the field who are working under very challenging circumstances. As just noted by High Commissioner Bachelet, the actual toll is likely to be much higher. We condemn these grave violations of the right to life, liberty and security in the strongest terms. In this and in many other ways, the military invasion has caused the people in Ukraine immense suffering and irreparable harm. The consequences of this unprovoked military attack for the protection and promotion of human rights in Ukraine will be profound and long-lasting, and the catastrophic and traumatic effects of forced displacement and the destruction of vital infrastructure will last for generations, including for children for whom the trauma will last a lifetime. A wide range of legal standards apply to armed conflict settings, including those enshrined in humanitarian, human rights, and criminal international law, as well as concrete policy agendas. These systems do not compete or exclude each other, but rather coexist with the aim of protecting human dignity. And ongoing proceedings before the International Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, as well as the announced opening of an investigation by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, clearly show this complementarity. Mr. President, our hope is that this Council will play, play its due role in that equation 
by placing and maintaining human rights at the center of this response through a series of concrete measures. First, by committing all efforts necessary to ensure due accountability from an evidence-based approach. You have a unique call to harness and reunite, preserve and analyze evidence in the manner in which this unprovoked attack will impact human rights. And it is to be expected that your special procedures will receive significant information about the way in which the human cost is to be assessed under international human rights law standards. Second, we call on all members of the international community, especially those providing support and shelter to people fleeing the conflict, to uphold the fundamental principle of non-discrimination. In conflict, Populations, communities, and peoples historically subjected to discrimination suffer increased exposure to risk, as well as actual damage from that exposure. We are deeply disturbed, for example, that women and children may be disproportionately affected by this war, like all wars, and that women and girls are more exposed to the risk of gender-based and sexual violence. That third country nationals may be subjected to discriminatory treatment as they flee the conflict and denied access to special essential assistance. That existing barriers faced by persons with disabilities and older persons will be amplified and that gender identity and sexual orientation will exacerbate the exposure to violence. Despite the intensity of the crisis, it is primordial to ensure that women are included in decision-making on important processes that are uh, ongoing, particularly the humanitarian response as well as the political negotiation process. Similarly, all parties should allow safe and unfettered passage to destinations outside of Ukraine for all those fleeing the conflict and facilitate the rapid, safe and unhindered access to humanitarian assistance for all those in need without discrimination. Several of my colleagues, Mr. President, will refer to these issues in more detail in upcoming public statements. Within this context, business should also be called to engage in heightened human rights due diligence, this call extending to companies in all sectors, from technology companies to those who have factories in a conflict setting to the financial sector, consistent with the UN guiding principle on business and human rights. A third element is that a human rights-based approach is that as long as it is safe and practicable, the voices and knowledge of the Ukrainian civil society and human rights defenders must be given a fundamental place. We echo the words of the Secretary General to the General Assembly as we face what could become Europe's world humanitarian and refugee crisis in decades. According to the latest briefings by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, above one million refugees, mainly Ukrainians and third country nationals, have now fled Ukraine to neighboring countries. Moreover, around 1 million people have been internally displaced within Ukraine, many of whom beyond the reach of humanitarian assistance due to the volatile security context, threat against humanitarian workers, and restrictions imposed on their movement. And these numbers will likely continue to grow. Mr. President, this Council is also called to deal with an array of human rights challenges around the world. We trust your leadership to ensure that the current necessary focus on the urgent situation will not detract from attention to freedoms of assembly, association and expression in the Russian Federation. Our vigilant peers have already warned this council on restrictions to fundamental freedoms within the Russian Federation, which are particularly alarming. Peaceful anti-war demonstrations continue to be arbitrarily arrested with reports suggesting that some 7,000 people have been arrested since Thursday last week. We call for those arrested and detained to be treated consistently with the Russian Federation's international human rights obligations and be released without further delay. In addition, the threat posed to the environment by the armed conflict with areas reportedly contaminated by radiation is also a source of deep concern. Mr. President, the special procedures uh, strongly urge the Russian Federation to listen to the collective voices of the international community 
which is now speaking unanimously and saying unequivocally that these military actions are unacceptable to us all. As human rights experts, my colleagues and I urge the Russian Federation to observe and respect international law, to end hostilities Im immediately and unconditionally, to stop immediately all human rights violations stemming from the attack, to enable human rights defenders in Ukraine and in the Russian Federation to carry out their peaceful work, to facilitate the immediate and unhindered delivery of humanitarian assistance without any discrimination as to nationality, race and ethnicity, and to restore the ability of the people in Ukraine to exercise their human rights and fundamental freedoms without military or external interference. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Quiero informar que la lista de oradores está cerrada. Ahora escucharemos a los países concernidos. Tiene la palabra el distinguido representante de la Federación Rusa. Tiene cinco minutos. Благодарю вас, господин председатель. Хотел бы напомнить, что ситуация на Украине находится в воле зрения Совета с 2014 года. Именно тогда к власти в Киеве в результате антиконституционного переворота пришел режим, который в лучших традициях нацистской Германии принялся фактически уничтожать русскоязычное население своей страны. Трагические результаты хорошо известны. Это и десятки заживо сожженных в Доме профсоюзов в Одессе, и расстрел снайперами мирных протестующих на самом Майдане, и жестокие расправы по всей Украине с несогласными. Население Донбасса не захотело жить в вечном страхе и быть в итоге истребленным. Хотя Киеву для достижения мира на собственной территории нужно было всего лишь выполнить взятые им же обязательства по Минскому комплексу мер. Восемь лет Совет регулярно обсуждает ситуацию на Украине. И в чем мы продвинулись на это время? У ВКПЧ подготовил 45 докладов на основании материалов, созданной им же наблюдательной миссии. В каждом из них фиксировали страдания населения Донбасса, тысячи мирных жителей, которого, включая сотни детей, погибли и в результате бомбовых ударов со стороны вооруженных сил Украины. Это граждане Украины, ни в чем не повинное гражданское население, которое не хотело войны. Они готовы были разговаривать с Киевом, прося лишь законную автономию для сохранения своей идентичности и своих жизней. Говорилось в докладах и о пытках, и произвольных арестах, зажиме и убийствах журналистов и оппозиционных деятелей, ненавистнических заявлениях, дискриминации, ущемлении прав национальных меньшинств, включая венгров, русских, цыган. Казалось бы, в руках членов Совета были все факты, на основании которых можно было бы сделать соответствующие выводы, чтобы исправить положение, создать условия для развития демократии и сохранения многонационального и многокультурного украинского общества. Можно было бы спасти жизни убитых вооруженными силами Украины и националистами Данчан и Луганчан, не допустить нынешней эскалации. Для этого странам ЕС и США нужно было дать этим процессам адекватную оценку и оказать воздействие на киевские власти с тем, чтобы побудить их предпринять шаги по улучшению ситуации в собственной стране и урегулированию конфликта в Донбассе. Вместо этого все восемь лет вы игнорировали трагедию жителей этого региона, да и по сути дела всей Украины. Хоть раз вы выразили сочувствие и солидарность с переживающими бомбежками в подвалах Данчанами и Луганчанами? Где же ваша принципиальность в вопросе расследования трагедий в Одессе и на Майдане? Почему вы вместо того, чтобы отстаивать права и свободы украинцев и бороться за их жизнь, во всем потакали и продолжаете потакать преступному режиму в Киеве, стыдливо закрывая глаза на его преступления. Хочу задать вопрос представителям США и Евросоюза, стран Евросоюза. В 
каких международных правозащитных документах, участниками которых являются ваши страны, написано, что поставка летального оружия способствует спасению человеческих жизней. А это оружие поступает регулярно, и все вы смотрите телевидение, как идет накачка этим оружием киевских вооруженные силы. Или, может быть, вы основываетесь на собственном опыте ведения военных действий в других странах? Только в ходе агрессии, как известно, в 1999 году НАТО против Югославии, когда был, применялось абсолютно негуманное вооружение и проводились неизбирательные удары кассетными бомбами, погибло порядка двух тысяч гражданских лиц, включая детей. А как быть сотнями тысяч человеческих жизней, которые унесла ваша миссионерская деятельность в Афганистане, Ираке, Ливии или Сирии? Все предельно просто. Спокойствие и процветание Украины не в ваших интересах. Жизнь простого украинца вас не интересует. Урегулирование ситуации в этой стране вам не нужно. А марионеточный режим Зеленского вас интересует только как инструмент давления и разменная карта в вашем противостоянии с Россией. В этой связи не видим добавленной стоимости в сегодняшних дебатах. Об этом говорит вся скоординированная подготовка к ним и уже прозвучавшие на различных уровнях выступления. Благодарю вас. Mr. President, Madam High Commissioner, dear distinguished delegates, friends and partners. Yesterday, right after I had finally managed to record my message on behalf of Ukraine, I had to rush in the basement because of the alarm behind my window, because of the airstrike alarm. And we do see it quite often here where I stay, because we are alive, but we are not safe. We have gathered here today to address the very existential threat to human rights as principle. A threat caused not only by the breach of the fundamental principles of international law enshrined in documents like the UN Charter, but also the breach of SEIN by a major power, by the permanent five Security Council member, by one of the biggest countries in the world that was supposed to assure the guarantees of safety for my country by a weak leader who wants to seem and to look strong, by President Putin, who pushed his 140 million country into hell of crime and into hell of violation of justice against my country. As we speak here today, Russia's full-scale invasion entered its second week. Every day, we witness both death and life dignity and dishonor, death, when, for example, a bleeding six-year-old girl with unicorn pajama could not be saved by doctors in Mariupol a couple of days ago, life, when one of the private maternity clinic in Kiev had been bombed and women gave birth to their newborns under the ground, dishonor, when Russia hits us with missiles in the middle of the night when we sleep, when there is no chance to see and better feel the danger, when Russian police puts behind bars hundreds of honest and clean living Russians who dare to say no to the war and who dare to resist to the Putin's regime, and dignity, when millions of Ukrainian people resist, when they fight with Russian tanks with bare hands, like it happened in Borodyanka and Brovary nearby Kyiv or Starobilsk in Luhansk region. When thousands of Ukrainians came out as a human shield in Energodar to protect Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And this all happens here in Ukraine, in my country, in the year 2022, right in front of your eyes, right in front of your doors. Millions of my compatriots were forced
to become refugees or eternally displaced persons because of the Russian aggression. I know what it means to lose your home. I have this personal pain since 2014 when I left my home at Crimea with my daughter, with a cat in the basket and two cars full of books and clothes. And I wish no one to leave it through ever. Russian bombs are destroying the cities and villages of my homeland, targeting residential areas, school, orphanages, hospitals, churches, museums, TV towers, central squares, and critical infrastructure. We did nothing to provoke it. We just strive to live independently and to build up our future as we see it, as we want, not our neighbor. The only reason why this is taking place is because a group of war criminals with an access to the nuclear button concluded that our people are too weak to resist and to fight and the world would not care. They put themselves above the international law and above the rules-based order. But Ukraine is resisting and our international coalition is strengthening every day. The overwhelming support in the United Nations General Assembly that we saw yesterday by the vote is yet another testify of this fact. The very reaction of you, Mr. President, your Madam High Commissioner, and all those who were in the hall yesterday after Ukraine delivered a speech when all of those in the hall stood up and gave us great applause and ovations is yet another act of solidarity. And I really was so emotional to see the video sent by Ambassador Filipenka to me. I'm very thankful for this solidarity. Mr. President, recent events clearly point to the fact that the Russian troops fighting in Ukraine carry out the most blatant violations and abuses of human rights, systematically engage in acts that clearly amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. We thank the High Commissioner and the Human Rights Council Special Procedures for their objective assessment of the situation. We also wish to acknowledge the important legal focus of the Russian aggression against Ukraine by International Court of Justice the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and European Court for and of Human Rights. We believe the Human Rights Council has a leading role to play in uniting the effort for ensuring accountability of Russia for its crimes against my country. This is the reason why, at the end of this urgent debate, the Council will consider a resolution establishing the Commission of Inquiry into violations of human rights and international humanitarian law stemming from Russia's war. We believe this initiative will become a next step with concrete practical implication in continuation of the UN General Assembly resolution called Aggression Against Ukraine adopted yesterday with overwhelming majority of UN member states. Mr. President, I wish to take this opportunity to thank all of those colleagues from different regions of the world who expressed numerous words of encouragement to us and the Ukrainian people over the last week and for your strong solidarity with my country. This is the very moment of truth, not only for my country that is striving for its survival, but for the whole international human rights system and its fundamental institutions, and for those who were entrusted to promote human rights as members of this council. In this extraordinary moment, we must stand together to ensure accountability for the war criminals spilling the blood of Ukrainian children. Barbarians should not and have no seat in the Alliance of Civilizations room. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Excelencias, nos volveremos a reunir a las 15 horas para continuar con el debate urgente sobre la situación de los derechos humanos en Ucrania derivada de la agresión rusa. Doy por concluida la octava reunión del 49 noveno periodo de sesiones.